Welcome to the Third Round Picks Podcast. To my invisible right, I have Mike Bibbins, a.k.a. at mbibs on Twitter. And to my invisible left, I have Richard Stamen, a.k.a. at Maz Draft. How y'all doing today? Holding up okay here in South Carolina despite the rain. Good to hear. You, Richard? Sorry for almost interrupting you, Mike. I'm pretty good. On my way back from a city that shall not be named. <laughs> You're doing well, Richard. You're doing well. We can hear you loud and clear. All right. Um, well, with that, obviously you just heard our name. We are the third round picks after uh, 20, 30 minutes of not very difficult deliberation. We came up with that name. And as the name implies, we are a draft podcast and uh, we are all Maz fans of various backgrounds uh, me personally, I am a high school student in Allen, Texas. I would redact that, but my the logo's on the podcast, so you know what, whatever. And to my invisible right, we have Mike Bibbins. Again. Yes, sir. Uh, I am not a high school student. <laughs> uh, graduated from South Carolina 2011, and I've been a Mass fan since I was about eight or nine years old, so... Yes, and you, Richard? Uh, I'm not. Either. I'm also not in high school. I uh, graduated from North Texas last year. I uh, I've been a Mavs fan since I was five. Couldn't give up the Orlando allegiance, so I kept both, and uh, that's how I got here. Yeah, my Mavs fan history is uh, well. Sports wasn't really in the family outside of OU in my mom's side, so. I never really got into the NBA until the Mavs went on their run in like 2011. Like I vaguely watched the Mavs once when they played the Nuggets and like I saw that game winner Jason Kidd had half court. It's about all I remember before the 2011 run. Um, well, with that, let's go ahead and uh, talk about let's go ahead about um, what is our differences and like our approach in scouting? I think we can all agree we have different mindsets in certain areas and how and like what areas we prefer. Uh, Bibbs, how about you go first? All right. Um, so yeah, I probably got a, the longest history here. Um, I got interested in scouting actually around the LeBron draft. Um, that was the year I was really really into college basketball. I was thinking about playing college basketball at the time. Um, and I was really interested in the big three, Carmelo, Darko, and LeBron, all coming from different backgrounds. Uh, LeBron being the guy straight out of high school that was doing grown man things. Uh, Carmelo going on a championship run in college. And then Darko, the foreign prospect. Um, going back to that draft, I think I, it made me realize that circumstances play a big part into how uh, a prospect turns out. Um, I still contend that Darko would not have been a bust had he gone to a bad team. Um, I think going to a team that was already a championship squad and not getting any playing time, uh, G League wasn't established, so he couldn't really go anywhere to get that confidence. By the time he got on the court, he was a broken, broken pass back. So with that all established, uh, my approach to scouting is I first look for what a player can do already. Um, obviously, I look at their physical tools to try to see what they may be capable of adding down the line. Uh, but for me, a big, big aspect of it is their personality and their approach to the game. So um, when I was scouting Giannis, I could see, obviously, that he was raw. Uh, he had physical tools. He couldn't shoot, really. Uh, but just his, his hunger and what I could see was his determination let me know that he had a really good chance of being special. Um, I don't try to figure out who's going to be the rookie of the year. I couldn't care less about that. For me, it's all about who's going to be the best player five years down the line and who's going to have a long career and when I look at uh, prospects. All right. Um, Richard, you want to go ahead and go? Yeah, mine's a little bit tricky. I, I haven't really, like, thought about, I guess, how like what my whole process is. I kind of – it's almost black and white for me, but not – like, the way I do it is, uh, like, first, I remember my first draft I, like, really started studying was, I was, uh, God, I was 12. Uh, <laughs> and it was whatever the Tyrus Thomas draft was. Cause oh, man. Because I could not stand Tyrus Thomas. And uh, <laughs> I never understood how that dude went, what was, like, number three or something like that. 
I mean, he was top yeah. 10. And uh, yeah. I remember that draft. And, oh, my goodness. Um, but what I, I like to do is, I mean, I've already I've watched NBA basketball my whole life. Like, when I was a kid, my dad would make me, uh, in order to learn to read, he would just give me the transaction sheets from each, from the whole summer like, before I started uh, – where I started kindergarten when I moved to Dallas and like I, I've been in it all the time so what I kind of do is I watch and see like I study the players and kind of write my own or I used to like write my own kind of scouting reports on the NBA players you know already in the league and everything hmm. and then kind of see what the common traits were that were bad and what got them good and obviously the game's changed so some of that's a little bit outdated now but I like to look for certain players within certain players it's something that I really like seeing and uh and for me like I, I like using a big blend of uh of stats and eye tests like 60 40 on stats in favor and then 40 in the eye test all right um my approach has kind of been a lot more like put together rapidly over the summer because that's the first time i've really seriously seriously got into scouting outside of uh, some experiments in the spring Mostly because I guess I was always interested in reading draft articles ever since like before the 2017 draft, which doesn't sound that long ago. But um, and then but I guess I never thought how I could turn that into a career. I just never thought about it that way. And then, you know, this summer I just was like a lot more curious and like I was going through getting my first job and I was just like thinking like what could I do to do the job I want? And that's how scouting came into my life. And I got some advice from a few people who've had some experience, but most of it came with me like learning on the fly. And I guess you could say my approach is a lot of trying to figure out, number one, how is this player, as soon as he gets in the NBA, how is he going to see time on the floor? Because it's a lot harder for this for a player to develop if they can't see playing time like at all. Because at the end of the day, practices is is going to help, but nothing is like game experience. Um, so, and then another thing, whenever I'm trying to write my reports, I focus a lot on uh, trying to get me or anybody else to like be able to like see as much as they can of this player in their head based on what I'm writing, and like think how would that fit within their team is all up to them, obviously. But that's what I'm trying to like get into someone's mind is how that player is and how they play and I'll throw in numbers whenever I feel like they'll help, but I don't want to force numbers down throats. Although I definitely do think about numbers, but not until after I watch film. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like uh, that last part, I, I, I realized I left mine on a, on a taste. I did not want mine to leave on. Um, but like I, I watched first, I watched like five games first and I'll look at the stats and kind of see like, is what I'm seeing aligning with the stats and everything like that. You know, I think I'm, I like how how different all of our approaches are. Um, and for me, uh, before last year, I would just watch like highlight videos and try to catch things. Um, obviously, there would be players who I've watched play, but for the players that I hadn't watched, I was going by highlight videos, and I realized that was, I mean, those are going to be biased most of the time. Um, even if they're like isolating different parts of the person's game, they're still just picking out parts, bits and pieces going through the process last year where I made myself watch full games, like even of random foreign prospects in small markets. Like you can find those games on YouTube pretty easily, but uh, going through watching the games, you start to pick up on more. And as a, as a player myself, um, one thing I used to try to do is break down my opponents by watching them from the bench um, not again, not just what they're doing, but just how they how they think like that. That's a big part of scouting for me is figuring out how a player thinks the game, basically. And uh, when you watch highlights, you're not going to get that part of it. And that's that that I think that's going to help me going forward and hopefully enhance the, the hits and misses ratio. <laughs> yeah. And then I think another thing in addition to that is a lot of defense you're never going to see on a highlight tape because a lot of defense is preventing things from ever happening. So like that pass that was going to go inside to the cutter, that's net, right. that you, that I don't know, Josh Reeves blocked off 
you're never going to see that on a highlight tape because the pass never came, but it sure as heck made the job harder for the offense. Exactly. Exactly. And you're kind of almost leading me into a couple of my guys that are already in the league, and it's like like a go bear, for example. Uh, how often do guys not attempt the shot when I mean, he doesn't get the chance to, to block it because they just stopped or threw it out? Um, those are the type of things you're not going to catch on a highlight tape. So you, I do believe you have to watch actual games. For sure. Uh, um, I think I want to go back because you were talking about how there was no D-League whenever Darko came to league. I'm Googling this on the fly. The See, I fir- think there were like three teams. <laughs> there were eight teams starting in 2001. <laughs> okay. I don't think Detroit had a franchise, but okay. there w- they did exist. And actually, I do remember watching some of those early games. I, I promise it was not it was not a good thing back then. Um, oh yeah. And I feel like I mean, you got it pulled up there. Did they lose teams after the first couple of years? Oh yeah, I think they were like struggling to like exist for a while. Like a bunch of teams folded, and then like right. in two thousand five, they rewrote the CBA, and then they like funded it better. Exactly. So, so yeah, like Darko. I mean, just if you go back to those days, I mean, he's sitting on the bench watching, and I'm sure Rasheed Wallace wasn't exactly nice to him in practice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just not a. By the time he got on the court, he was he was already again broken. He had no confidence at all. Oh yeah, and but then in addition, I've heard stories. I'm not sure whether this was after or like a cause of him being in Detroit, but like stories about how he like no longer wanted to play basketball like at all, and like how he was never. I don't know whether he was motivated in the first place, but at like the end, he's like, whenever he could have gotten paid like significant money, he's like, I don't want to play basketball at all. This sucks. I just want my money that I got earlier. Now I'm done. I don't want anything to do with this. Yeah, and and again, that I mean, just imagine being uh, like I've read stories about uh, Ku Coach joining the Bulls and how Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan just abused them in the early days until he earned their respect. Like, just imagine a kid walking into that Detroit locker room with those tough guys, giving them a hard like veterans uh, with this high draft pick, just giving them a hard time, basically. And I mean, he was a young kid. I can imagine losing the desire to be around that pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, um, I, you could say the same thing about like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan's effects on a uh, Kwame Brown. Like what could Kwame Brown have been if he'd not been so intimidated all the time by these guys who are like revered, but also like very scary people. <laughs> so, you know, like, because in the practice, they're all, like, ridiculously intense and, like, you know, mom mentality, it factor, it times 10 for Michael Jordan, you know, stuff like that. And then with Ku Coach, you have, like, the 92 Olympics where, like, the bit, uh, where Pippen and Jordan, like, set out to, like, destroy Tony Ku Coach, like, specifically. Right. <laughs> and I so, definitely lost signals. I don't know how much <laughs> of, of what I said was missed. I, I heard most of it. Um, Richard, you still on the line? I am still here, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's good. Um, I guess we should go ahead and move on to like some what biases we have. So uh, for me, I have a big stan, not stan specifically, but like I always favor players who are versatile and also are very high effort. Obviously, I don't think anyone doesn't like high effort, but... And then team defense, I prioritize team defense over on-ball defense unless you get to an elite level of on-ball defense just because at the end of the day, if you're if you're looking to build a team that's going to win in the playoffs, you need elite on-ball defense in order for it to be any effective against those teams that you're going to be competing against in like the conference finals or even the semifinals. So... Whereas team defense, you're always going to need a strong team defensive structure uh, uh, throughout the bench to your starting rotation because otherwise, you know, teams like the Warriors can expose you even without guys like Kevin Durant on the floor because they still have the pretty good ball movement or like the Spurs can expose you with their ball movement, stuff like that. Um, for me, as far as biases... 
I'm gonna say uh, quiet confidence is a, a big thing that I'm I'm very biased about, and the underdogs. So, like last year, a guy like Kyrie Thomas, who uh, isn't really a demonstrative guy, isn't in your face. Um, nobody's really talked about him for a while, but I, he just come out and kill Villanova uh, by himself on both ends of the floor. Um, Two-way guys also, guy that hustles on defense and, and, and can still get buckets is also something that uh, I'm probably going to overrate, even if they have holes in other parts of their game. Yeah, I mean, for me, when it comes to two-way guys, I think those are always going to be supremely valuable, but they they got to make sure they can, like, work. They can't be, like, this person who, who like, only can shoot, like, within, like, 10 feet, and then they're, like... <laughs> But otherwise, like, let's say Andre Robeson, I'm not going to call that guy an elite two-way player, even though you could, in the college level, you could say he is, and he could certainly even put up numbers. But at the NBA level, it just doesn't work. Like, it has to have translatable aspects for me. And, like, I'm kind of worried about that with Kyrie Thomas in certain ways, but we'll see. He's been playing decently well so far, so. But outside of his jumper, I'm not sure what he has yet because I haven't personally watched him, but I'm sure he's been doing pretty well. Gotcha. He's just getting healthy, I believe. So um, he's, he's had a couple good games, but nothing to write home about yet. All right. Uh, Richard, what about you? I'd say athleticism. I'm a, I'm a soccer athlete. They have a higher chance of players who are not so athletic now. There's obviously anomalies that, like, there's Jokic is going to have a higher ceiling than some, you know, it's just can jump out the building and protect the rim. Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a specific example of who versus who on that, but I really, really am a sucker for uh, like just really good athletes. Like, that automatically jumps you like 10 spots in my board. All right. Well, I think we will both find common ground then because I, even though I'm not necessarily like Mr. Athleticism guy, I really do like team defense and defense in general. So I think we can both agree we're big fans of Sean Marion. <laughs> Is that fair to say? <laughs> I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a. I'm a sucker for Sean Marion type of players. You, I mean, you, you, if you see me on Twitter, you know I'm a Gary Clark guy. Gary Clark is obviously not Sean Marion as an athlete, but he has a lot of defensive ability that I really appreciate. And, you know, there's another Clark again this year, Brandon Clark. And I might really like him too, just based on what I've been seeing with his numbers, but I'm definitely going to have to watch him first. Um, let's see. We can move on to some early sleepers slash guys that are lower ranks that you really love. Um, Richard, why don't you start with Desmond Bain? Oh, whoa, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, got, I got a couple more besides him. Uh, but, yeah, Desmond Bain is my first one, the DFW product. Um, I like him. He's, like, he's explosive. He's not very long, uh, and I haven't seen a bunch of uh, shot creation from him, but he could be a good defender. I think he's a good enough athlete. He's kind of bites on crossovers a little bit too much, but I like him a lot. Good shooter. Uh, like I said, explosive, so he can get to the lane. It's really good off ball uh, as just any kind of cutter. Uh, so I'm a big fan of him. Like like I said, nice shooting stroke and a really good athlete. It's a pretty nice combo for me. Um, some other ones I've got, though. Uh, I really like DiMaggio Wiggins from Bowling Green. They don't want him shooting threes just because I think they don't want him shooting threes. They don't have him shooting threes because he's so dominant in the post. But he's got a high free throw percentage. Um, got a good shooting shirt to match it. Like, I like him a lot. He's, I think, a senior. Really good, uh, really good athlete as well. So, and then my last one is from Western Kentucky, besides Charles Bassey, uh, who I don't really think is a sleeper. You've got Tavion Hollingsworth, who can shoot like no other, and uh, he's a really good athlete as well. So, kind of seeing my biases in that. But one more, actually, let me add one more that's not a great athlete Tyler Hero, or Hero, Har- however you say his name. Um, I like him. I think he's going to get a look just because he's such a good scorer. Um, he's undersized. He has a negative wingspan, so there's a lot of negatives there. But he's also a pretty good playmaker. I think he'll at least get some looks. And he also goes to Kentucky, so he'll definitely get some looks. But he's definitely those are some guys to keep in mind for me. 
All right, Richard, I have a quick question for you in regards to Hero because, you know, we have a similar guy like that in last year's class who was, you know, relatively not athletic, you know, kind of small, negative wingspan, elite shooter. Didn't always get to show his scoring abilities, but when we saw him in summer league, he definitely showed off. Uh, what do you think uh, is? Do you think it's a viable comparison to say Tyler Hero is like similar to uh, Sviatoslav Mikhailik? Nah, I think their roles will be different in the NBA. I still see Mikhailu as like purely a shooter who can maybe hit like some layups through his pump fakes. Like I've seen him do that a couple times this year. Um, but I think Hero is more of an off the dribble kind of score. So I, I think they're a little bit different. I'm str- I've been struggling to think of a comparison. Uh, the first one that's coming to mind isn't that strong. It's Shabazz Muhammad in terms of just scoring styles. But Hero is a much better shooter, so or a three-point shooter. But they're really similar from mid-range from what I've seen. That, that's like the first one that comes to mind. Um, but I'm, I'm struggling, still trying to figure out who Hero Hero. I still don't know how to say his name. I'm sorry. It's going to be a battle all season. <laughs> Um, so I want to see who he compares to, but I think that'll take some time for me. All right, Biz, you want to have yours go ahead? All right. Um, so I'm not deep into to my scouting for this year, um, but there were a few guys that caught my attention last year uh, that I'm going to be looking to see uh, take another step coming into this new season. Uh, one of them, uh, Quindary Weatherspoon at Mississippi State. Um, Nick Weatherspoon, the little brother, is the one that gets all the attention. Um, but Quindary, actually, every time I went to watch uh, Nick, he always caught he caught my attention every time I watched him play. Um, I looked at his numbers, and his three point shooting has actually gotten worse every single year at Mississippi State. Um, he started thirty nine percent his freshman year with four attempts a game, and is down to twenty two so far this year. Uh, but he's just, he's a, he's athletic. Uh, he's a bucket getter. He's a guy that probably won't get drafted, uh, but will definitely be getting some looks, um, in the summer league and beyond, uh, just because like, again, he's, he's long, he's athletic and he just seems to make plays when they matter. Um, and is one of those, the guys that could accidentally end up on a team uh, down the line, like a Blakeney or something like that. Um, and then um, of course I love my foreign guys. So, a guy that I thought was going to come out last year, Kostya Mushidi. Uh, I'm actually glad he stayed overseas, uh, but I think he's a guy that could could take a leap this year um, as well. So I'm going to be looking forward to seeing him play, if he can stay healthy. All right. You got any more? Is that it? That's all, I'm, all I've really, really got uh, as far as guys that I'm looking forward to seeing this year. Maybe Carson Edwards from Purdue, but he's not really a sleeper. Um then let's see here. Uh, John Petty in Alabama is a good one, but again, he's not really a sleeper. He's a known commodity. Uh, so really, really, I, I'm really looking forward to finding that next guy that I'm going to call a sleeper. All, All right. right. Oh, oh, sorry. For Bibbs. Uh, All right. So when you watch Weather Weatherspoon, this actually isn't too much of a uh, question; it's more of a statement. So when you watch Nick Weatherspoon, supposedly I haven't seen him either this year, but supposedly has changed his three-point shot form like because you know he's okay. a really good athlete that's not, no secret whatsoever but he changed right. his three-point shot form this year so if that goes down like now i'd say monitor that monitor that throughout the season and kind of like when it gets to sec play i bet it starts to go up a little bit i love nick weatherspoon i like both of them i'm a bigger fan of nick though but i like that bit. right I, I definitely like nick as well um and again, like you said, if his three-point shot is going to start falling, that's, I mean, he's shooting 55% so far this year. Uh, 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 shooting the same amount of attempts he shot last year, he's pretty much doubled his three-point percentage so far. Um, we're only seven games in, but that's that's a ridiculous, I, I doubt it's going to stay that high, but that's, I mean, that's a clear improvement, I think. Um, if he sticks with whatever this new motion is, uh, I do like you said. I like his athleticism, his quickness. Um, but yeah, they, he might uh, Quindary might ride his brother's coattails in like uh, Blake Griffin's brother did. All right. Well, uh, now it's falling to me. For me, watching uh, 
the very limited uh, sample of uh, Big 12 and Big 10 players for some upcoming pieces on uh, LockDraft.com. Um, some of my favorite guys, Rich already mentioned Desmond Bain. I'm a big fan of him. I've seen him create a little off the dribble, uh, pull up some pull-ups that haven't necessarily gone the greatest, but he's shown some uh, confidence taking him at the least. And, you know, I've seen him do some playmaking, create for others, do some like over the shoulder passes on the move. But, you know, a couple, you know, it's not like he does tons because, you know, Kenrich Williams was running a lot of the offense last year still. So we'll see how he does in his expanded role, or at least hopefully expanded role this year. Um, another guy in the Big 12. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. I've talked about him a little bit. His name is uh, Deshaun Corpru. He was the, uh, I'm not sure if he was the, but like he was definitely one of the best junior college players last year. He's at Texas Tech now. He's been scorching hot this year, but he still hasn't earned enough minutes for me to be happy. But he's been playing pretty well in the limited minutes he has been getting. I don't anticipate him to be shooting 50% from three for the rest of the year at Texas Tech or anything, but he still shot 36% from the three in junior college. And he's, he knows how to get off the floor quick uh, off one foot. He drives inside. It'll take a, a lot, a lot of a uh, right inside the three point line, uh, pull up twos. He makes his free throws, you know, stuff like this. He's even made like uh, a couple plays for others, but he, other times he might get a little, little uh, shot, uh, trigger happy. But in general, he's pretty unselfish most of the time. Um, another guy in the Big Ten, one guy that is uh, my favorite is, I'm not sure, is he even a sleeper anymore? Isaiah Roby is a guy I'm a fan of because he just does so many things. But at the same time, you never get to see it all in the same game. You have to watch like five games before you can see his entire toolbox. Like he'll, he'll be like one game. He'll just be like cutting the entire game because like they want James Palmer, who isn't even that good to like run the offense and score the ball all the time. And then this other time you'll see him like handle the ball for like, you know, five minutes on the court. And then the rest of the game he's taking pick, pick and pop jumpers. And then another time you'll see him like setting hard screens and, you know, rolling to the basket and then finishing off one, not necessarily with power, but just getting up in the air pretty quickly. He makes his free throws, which is always nice. And then on defense, he he's pretty good at making rotations at the right time. Um, and he's also good at timing the exact moment to, like, rush his man and steal the ball that's and coming on a pass from behind him and then initiating the fast break uh, and drawing some fouls. So some stuff like that. But at the same time, he struggles being physical consistently. And he often got out physical by super huge guys like Isaac Haas or stuff like that. But I th I think he'll get better eventually. But it's going to take some time for him to be more physical. And also there are questions about his confidence just because he, he comes from this very humble hometown. On and Corey has a very humble personality. He doesn't fight for playing time with his coach. He only gets played like 25 minutes a game. He should be playing over 30, if you ask me and any other person that watches Nebraska. Um, another guy that I've been a fan of is uh, Ayo Desunmu at uh, Illinois. He's been playing pretty well from what I remember, but I was watching him play against Bull Bull in uh, the Like Mike Invitational. He played pretty well. I uh, watched him in FIBA play. You know, he didn't try to chunk up too many off the dribble shots. He mostly focused on driving to the basket or passing. He didn't turn the ball over that much either. So but the main problem with him is he's his shot is not the greatest. It's the form is pretty poor. His footwork isn't consistently on target. So like he's having to turn his entire body to like face the basket and weird stuff like that. Or and then on defense, he like doesn't always body up his man despite having some pretty decent strength. But when he's like locked in, he can like really be a pest against smaller guards. And with his six foot five frame, if he can just add some weight, he can really be a threat um, to like two guards as well. Very interesting list. I think uh, when I compiled my list of targets this year, all, the only place that had all three of the guys you named was uh, Stephanie. <laughs> um, 
And actually, uh, the last guy you named, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, Ayo. Yeah. Um, he uh, He's the last guy on my list of 140 players. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I took a peek at this list of like 212 or so. That was just like a general, like, here's some guys you might theoretically want to watch and then determine how you like them. And and then I like looked at guys who are like been ranked high, but not like high, high, just like top 30 and then like watched all 30 of them and then like figure out who I like just because I'm starting from scratch here. Right. Um, oh, and then I'll go ahead and mention one more guy. Uh, Jordan Poole on Michigan. Yeah. He finally is starting consistently now. And he got his shot together a little bit. It's not like 27% anymore. It's back to like, you know, mid 30s. He's, he loves to take a lot of off dribble shots and to like, I guess I would say play the J.R. Smith role, but not as athletic or anything. He's shown some uh, moments where he's initiated offense and driven to the basket or kicked out to open shooters on the move. And he makes free throws on defense. He's not, he wasn't always engaged, but he has enough size and um, length to like bother ones and twos. But he's going to have to show he can actually apply that a lot better. I love, I love that Jordan Poole name drop. I didn't know if he was going to count as a sleeper because like everyone knows him from the tournament last year. So I wasn't yeah. sure, but I feel like people only think of him with that shot. And not that he's actually like a really capable shooter. Like I tweeted something, I'll retweet it once this gets posted again. That uh, that Jordan Poole, like his shot off the catch and shoot, like there's no hesitation. He has limitless range for a college shooter. Like there's so much to like from it. He just needs to show the IQ on offense and or really both ends, um, and just the uh, creating for others as well, which they kind of go hand in hand. So I uh, I really like Jordan Poole. Good. Good pick there. Yeah, I liked him too. I just wish he would be playing a lot better this year because he had a little bit of hype from Stepien. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, and that kind of takes me into like, what I think we should do next. If we're, if I, it might be too early to say this out loud, but uh, I, I want to go after polarizing prospects and see where we're at on different guys that <clears throat> some people don't have ranked or some people have in the first round or whatever the case may be. Those guys that people there's not really a consensus on yet yeah i mean my thing with steppy and the reason why i like actually peek at their list at all is just because you do you'll see guys you've never seen anywhere else like i don't know if exactly. i've seen deshaun corporu anywhere <laughs> he's, he's been kicking butt though on, on, on yep. yeah but like i'm not like it's not like i take i don't take the rankings their work for their word or anything or like Right. trust I, I i like read their player stuff but like i'm it's my opinion at the end of the day and just like it's just like trying to get an idea of who i should watch and then if i find someone else who's standing out statistically then i'll watch them too but like otherwise your might as well be shooting darts in the dark and i just don't enjoy <laughs> guessing at that point so you know exactly so that's why i like trying to look at as many lists as possible without reading what they're actually saying about the players i just take the the rankings and try to prioritize based on consensus i guess um but i will say if, I, I hate to be that guy but i have to get one more sleeper in um and it's a homer pick um chris silva he uh started center for south carolina okay. uh def sec defensive player of the year last year um everybody's talking about the modern nba and how you're gonna have smaller more athletic centers um, I think if if there was a perfect time for him to come into the league, I think it's 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 uh it's now. Uh, he's a shot blocker, um, physical, hard dunker. Uh, I think the college game is kind of rough for him because they call so many weak fouls, and he's basically in a constant struggle to stay on the court because of that. But um, I think he's the type of guy that can explode in like the summer league type of thing. Uh, type of scenario or in workouts and stuff like that. He's going to be a freak. So. All right. So just curious because I have not much of a frame of reference on Chris Silva. Okay. So I've just been thinking about guys that I've heard vaguely about um, shot blockers, athletic bigs who are a little undersized. Um, is he as raw as Silvio D'Souza or does he have like some refined defensive instincts? 
So, like, I've been watching him since he first came, and he, like, had barely ever picked up a basketball before he got to South Carolina. Um, he is – he's a Frank Martin guy. He's smart. He's learned the game. He's not raw at all, in my opinion, as far as defensive. Uh, he knows his rotations. He's always in the right spot. He guards on the perimeter. Um, his problem is that sometimes he wants – to change the game with a block and he'll pursue it in that scenario um, if we're down or something like that. But as far as knowing his instincts and things like that, he's, he's, he's a pretty smart defender. I think it, the only reason he's not on radar is because he doesn't add much offensively. All right. I see. Um, just to note, since uh, this would be important, um, Bibbs, you have your homers a little bit ever so slightly, but I know you do your job limiting them. <laughs> Richard, I know you kind of like you watch a lot of TCU and you're I don't know if you I think you said you went like that went there or something. Anyway, I'm sorry. And then but for me, like no one's come out of Allen High School, <laughs> even though Allen's been a good program. Like the biggest guy of note they've pumped out is this guy named Jalen Walker, who's on Navy and uh, he hasn't done much. So even though he won state player of the year and everything just hasn't done much. So you won't catch me being a homer for anybody. <laughs> I mean, you got to define homer there. You got to define homer. Like, Oh yeah. Like even like, like, like you can't accuse me of one at all. It was like, even like stupid people on Twitter. That's what I mean. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, all right. Now we, we just want to move on to just the big guys you know, the top fives or like the type of guys you just like, oh my God, they're definitely going top five, like Zion Williamson, Cam Reddish, or if you still believe in Nasir Little after him being a big disappointment, or Bull Bull, if you actually like him, except Richard not necessarily likes him. We'll find out together. Um, <laughs> well, putting words in my mouth. I said not necessarily. We're about to find out together. <laughs> So, Richard, why don't you give your take on Bull Bull since you just watched him last night at Houston? Or not. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I, I must have cut out because I jumped from one thing to the next. So, I'll just, you know what? Let's lead in. I'll go first. So, <laughs> Bull Bull, he's got all the, look. The upside is totally there. Like, I get it. I get every bit of it. I tweeted about it today. Um, Oregon Miss uses just about everyone there. It's not a really well-run all. Like, their best shot creator is coming off the bench and played, I think, like, 20 minutes. It's not good. Pretty quick at all. So, their defense, they were, it works. They have Bull Bull and Kenny Wooten, two of the best rim protectors in the country, just camped out in the paint. I don't think Oregon even, or I'm sorry, Houston scored in the paint until the second half, if I'm not mistaken. They're doing that right. Like, he's going to be a good rim protector, but the lack of strength really does scare me. I know that's something that will be added, but I'm not even sure you can add that much strength to that, that frame. But also, his instincts and Honestly, his motor on defense, I know that there's different factors going into the motor. But his instincts on defense are really far away from what a lot of other raw players that have come out and have projected the same way. He's just so far behind on them. And, and, and I, I, last night when I was watching him warm up, there's no clean follow-through. It's almost pure palm that he's shooting with, which has to do with his physical traits, but it's still not, not exactly the best thing. But he can put the ball on the floor, and I was really, really um, fascinated by that. I was impressed with his guard skills. I just don't know if he can put it all together. I just have some doubts. I'll judge after the uh, Pac-12 starts getting you know, picked up and everything like that. But, but I, I have my doubts. He's going to have his on and off, honestly, weeks. Like this week, he hasn't been that good. So it's just going to be something, can he put it together or not? If he can, he's a bust. There's really no way around it. If he can, that dude's going to be a star. He's going to be what a lot of people saw in, in Bomba. I know they're not the similar players, but with the raw, long kind of skin, just the physical aspect, that's what I think a lot of people are going to see. They're going to draw that comparison. I don't think it's that accurate, but it is like the low-hanging one. All right. Well, I just want to note, 
whenever a bad week for a player is last night scoring 23 points, two of five from three, seven of 14 from the field and three blocks and only one turnover and he's seven foot two or seven foot three. I just, it's so crazy to think about nonetheless. <laughs> no, I know. I, it is, it is crazy. I mean, I said the same thing about Colin Sexton last year where I went to the LSU Alabama game. And I think he went two of 14 and I had the opposite way. So he had like, I didn't even look at the stats until after the game and he was blowing me away. He's the best player on the court by a mile. And that included Tremont Waters, who I think is like speaking of sleepers. I think he's a good sleeper. He's a JJ Barea type. Anyways, he'll be in the NBA. So Colin Sexton, he was destroying him. He was eventually getting in his head. And, and I looked at the stats and like, he went two of 14 and he had like three assists and five turnovers. And it was the ugliest game statistically, but he was doing everything. He was getting to the lane. He was able to distribute. Uh, his teammates were not hitting any shots. I know I said only three assists, but uh, also speaking of, uh, I, I'm going to rebuttal Bibbs is a uh, sleeper. John Petty, ooh, that dude was like almost all of the <laughs> misses I'm talking about. He was airballing left and right. <laughs> but so, I mean, sometimes, you know, like it does go off of it. Uh, I think it goes both ways. I tried not to look at the stats. I actually did not know he had 20 points. Um, I know he had one of the nastiest putback posters you'll see. It reminded me of one that Jonathan Isaac had that just stunned me. Um, but yeah, that, that I did not know he was having that. It's not his fault that they're losing, by the way. I'm not trying to. I need to clarify that. Bol Bol is like the best player on the team, and he's not so, anything wrong collegiately, you know. So I like hearing uh, from people that I respect as far as their scouting opinions um, on players that I haven't watched yet. Uh, before th- those are the only opinions I'll listen to is before I go into to scouting a guy, and uh, Bol Bol like. This is why I don't look at stats, because when you look at Bull Bull stats, I'm like, why isn't this guy being talked about as uh, a clear top five pick? I think uh, every consent, the consensus I looked at ranged him from anywhere from three to 21 um, on, on the list that I looked at. And I'm like, this dude's putting up 20 points, 10 rebounds and three blocks. Like, why is he number 21 on these scouting lists? And then. I watch highlights of him crossing somebody up and going to the basket, and I'm like, this dude is seven two. Like, what, what what is going on here? And I think what you what uh, Richard said is dead on. Is that regardless of the production, if you see things that you don't like by watching a player in a game, those are the things that that coaches are looking at, um, and they're going to keep him off the floor I when he gets that, to the yeah. NBA. I mean, like, because you can have a Julio Okafor who scored. Game in the post, but how much does that actually translate to the NBA? You know, exactly. Yeah, and now I'm going to take the red team approach. To that red team, I'll talk about what that means later. Um, so the thing is, Bobo is not Julio Okafor. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just drawing like the blank comparison, like saying like, you know, if someone's just getting post hooks all night. Like, yeah, they'll blow you away on stats. I was just speaking to Bibbs's point about um, about you can't judge off stats, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I'm like, I'm not saying I'm not really I don't have any real opinion on Bull Bull. I'm just like, oh, my God, look at all these clips, but not re- uh, holding back any real opinion of Bull Bull until I watch him beyond like halfway watching him when I'm really watching Ayo Desumu. So <laughs> and, and also with Bull Bull. There, uh, something big that is missing, and this applies to him and Wood, is uh, that you've got to factor in that their second highest recruit, who was like number 10, Luis King, it, it hasn't even played. He's their best shooter on the team. He's a good shot creator, at least from high school. So they're missing one of their best players. Obviously, it's going to be a lot more workload for their other players to score baskets and everything and pick up the load on the other end as well. So I, I think what you're going to see is when the stat you're, you're going to see a big difference in stats when Luis King is there and when he's not, I think it's going to be big for everyone. Like Will Richardson, uh, who I think is a future prospect, not one for this year, Kenny Wooten and Bull Bull. Yeah, but definitely not Pritchard, right? <laughs> Man, don't even get me started. If you ever put Peyton Pritchard on your board, I will quit this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, I just I just want to like say anywhere on the board. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Vince. Um, no. <laughs> I just want to say, because we've been th- talking about defensive effort with Bull Bull and like, you know, this guy that has these amazing physical traits and is still mobile and like is just impressive when it comes to all these physical traits. But then he's only one end of the floor consistently. So uh, how would you compare uh, Bull's defensive motor to uh, DeAndre Aiden's defensive motor? Because personally, I that's what ma- had me really low on DeAndre Aiden last year. So for me, I I didn't see the issue with Aiden's motor very often. I thought that was really overblown. Uh, in high school, it's the thing the way the best player. I thought he was consistently putting in effort. Yeah, there were some plays where, he, but like it wasn't a it wasn't a constant thing. I think it was like one play, and like it's still like I said a little bit worrisome. But Bull Bulls, I don't think it's a choice to be bad. I think it kind of has to do with the fact that, like, he four minutes into the game, he was, like, puffing and puffing after running down the court. Like, after the first media timeout, he was exhausted. And I think that has to do with it. He's taking more chances. He knows he's got, like, an eight-foot wingspan, so he can take those chances. And I think that has to do with it. I think once he gets better coached, better condition, you're going to see different results. Yeah, I'm wondering whether if he's if he's huffing and puffing, if it's just he needs to get like more work conditioning, like specifically, or whether he needs to slim down because I'm looking at his weight. It's like he said, he's only 245 pounds, so it's not like he's carrying loads and loads of weight, especially okay. at his size. Uh-uh. If he slims down, uh uh-uh. uh, no, 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 we're okay. <laughs> that's that's a red flag if he slims down. That's like Nerland's Noel or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nerland's is playing well this year. Yeah, I'll give them that. Oklahoma City's pretty good with getting the most out of, honestly, anyone. They're up there with the Mavs for doing that. So, I'll give them that. Tears as we realized that Rick Carlisle and Nerlens Noel couldn't get along because we easily could have just kept Nerlens this entire time and then, yeah. you know, not signed DeAndre. But... <laughs> You're getting that, too loud. <laughs> that's our one uh, Mavs take for the podcast. Put the penny in the jar. All right, uh, Bibbs, what do you got for any top prospects? Any thoughts, or have you just not really watched any? I'm telling you, I I've tried to avoid watching too many. I did end up watching the uh, Gonzaga uh, Duke game by accident. Um, I went to record it after it had started, um, and I ended up watching the whole game. Um, Rui Hakimura is is gonna be. I, if he continues to play well, he's probably going to be one of my guys that I'm higher on than everybody else. All right. Still, uh, I like him. I like his personality. In, what are your thoughts on uh, Brandon Clark? I do not have any opinions I'm willing to share on Brandon Clark. Okay, so I get it. You, you know, limited <laughs> sample and such. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to talk about anybody until I've seen at least two games. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I I mean, I'm not about to talk about Brandon Clark either because I have no real thoughts on Brandon Clark. I just, the things I'm <laughs> hearing sounds interesting, but until I'm seeing, it's all, you know, sound and noise. Exactly. And usually I'm going to be a skeptic on any, any sound and noise. I'd rather yeah. come in and doubting you than come in expecting you to be good and then I look for those things. Yeah. That's what happens whenever... Okay, no, I'm not going to put that shot. Nope, I'm not going to put that shot. Um, <laughs> Not going to be mean today. Okay. Um, Well, in the caveat, one game, caveat, one game that I watched the Duke team play Kentucky whenever there was obviously the biggest outlier game of all time. Um, You know, Zion Williamson, he made a lot of playmaking decisions on the move that really impressed me. RJ Barrett was playing in one of his few good games for in college so far and, you know, finishing very well at the basket, but also being a little shot trigger happy for me, which goes back to why I'd take Zion over him at this very moment without any other evidence outside of that one game caveat. Um, Cam Reddish, he definitely played third wheel in that game. He had some nice playmaking off the dribble, uh, finding teammates, and just being a threat with his with his shot and making a lot of threes. Um, Jack White has suddenly become an, an NBA prospect after that game. Whether or not he'll keep up that pace was yet to be seen. 
but he was very impressive with his hustle and, you know, taking open threes and just being, you know, tall and shooting and basically being kind of like Brian Cardinal for Duke, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, no impressions on Nasir Little. No real impression on Bol Bol. Um, I didn't focus as hard as Keldon, on Keldon Johnson or any of the Kentucky guys just because I was kind of not be, taking that game entirely seriously just because it was like a school night. I was just trying to have a little fun and do homework for the rest of the night. Um, let's see. Moving on to Romeo Langford, who I have actually watched both last year and this year. He has been somewhat of a disappointment because he was obviously he was had all his hype and with his uh shot making ability, but it definitely hasn't quite worked out to plan, I'd say. Um he was missing a lot of jumpers early in the season. I think he's kind of gotten back to the mean with that, but it's definitely not what like anybody would tell you in the highlight taste. And it turns out he has not gotten back to his uh good old form of like thirty plus percent. Twenty three percent ouch and only 69 percent of his free throws ouch but he he does a lot of scoring off the ball with cuts and just like straight line drives putting his shoulder into like these little two guards and drawing fouls and just being that type of guy which isn't necessarily so translatable to the nba which is why my stock is falling on him by the day you know it's a lot uh, some of the same stuff can be said for quinn and grimes as well, even though he was like red hot in that in the first game against Michigan State, but outside of that, he's been a disappointment. Um, Richard, I know you were talking in the in the group text about Quinn Grimes and how you didn't like him either so far. What do you think about Quinn Grimes this season? I I loved him after Michigan State. I thought he made a lot of good decisions. It's just after that, like getting benched for I think it was three consecutive games. For the final few minutes, it's just not a good look. I know against Tennessee, I, I didn't get to watch the whole game. I saw the second half. He wasn't doing anything special. It was really simple plays. Um, yeah, outside of one game, he's just been disappointing. I'm not a huge fan of his shot form. I know he's gotten stronger over uh, over the last year, which helps because his form is kind of similar to Harrison Barnes. And you have to be you have to have upper body strength to be able to convert that consistently, and uh, so that's big for him. But I, I'm waiting to. I'm reserving judgment until the Big 12. If it continue to, continues to happen, I'm ready to move on. Uh, I think which one of the losses, the guard loss, and I'm, I'm completely blanking. I know there's Dedrick, and then there's one other. I think it's Davon. Devon Dotson. Devon Dotson is who I'm trying to talk about. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Devon Dotson's actually been pretty impressive. Like I, I liked him. So it's Kansas is a weird team, a really weird team for me. Yeah. Uh, me, whenever I watch Devon Dotson, I haven't paid attention to him in college as hard. But in the two, two, two AAU games I saw just working on the preview piece, I think my biggest impression with him was how he didn't take a bunch of dumb shots off the dribble. He mostly focused on doing what he does best, but just like relying on it so much that sometimes it failed him and often like driving into multiple defenders and not having a good sense of timing with that. But when he's taking over a game, he can like single handedly like carry a team from like down 10 to like up 15 in the fourth. And it's just incredible to watch. He's definitely very shifty and quick. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it with him on the rest of Kansas. Uh, I was pretty impressed, impressed with, uh, Diedrich Lawson watching his Memphis tape, but you know, it's a different season now. He's, he showed some nice moments in the Michigan state game, but no further comment on this season with him. Um, that's about it for the most part outside of I'm going to go in and say that I am a really big fan of Dean Wade based on what I saw last year, but it'll be interesting to see how he plays this year. Cause I know they lost uh, like a, either last night or like a couple days ago. So it's going to be interesting to see how he played in that loss. Cause I really don't know at all. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, bring up my SEC guy. Um, guy we thought most people thought was coming out last year, Daniel Gafford. I um, think he's clearly positioned as the top center coming out. Yeah, um, pretty much. 
I, I think he was he was a guy that was probably going to get drafted in the first round if he came out last year. I respect guys that know that they can have a few things to work on and go back. So definitely looking forward to seeing him taking a step forward this year. And so far, I, I can't I don't have any complaints. Yeah, Daniel Gafford definitely could have given Robert Williams a run for his money in draft position just because of all of Robert Williams' personal problems. So it would have been interesting to see that he had gone into this draft. And, but instead, he's coming into this 2019 draft where he can really assert himself considering how this guard, this just class is very guard heavy. Right. So as I cry in tears about the fact that we didn't land either Robert Williams or Mitchell Robinson in the draft last year, despite having the ability to take Mitchell Robinson, but instead we had to take Jalen Brunson because Rick Carlisle is addicted to small guards. Put a penny in the jar. All right, I'm done. I like the Brunson pick. I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it at that. I, I still stand by that. Brunson would have been good. Brunson's gonna be really good. You're gonna look back in five years, and that dude's gonna be playing a role for someone that is really good. Right. But will he be on the Mavericks? Hopefully. Hopefully. I didn't. That's why I said someone. <laughs> and since we're gonna go, we're in the rabbit hole now. We're in here. If he is with it. Dallas, though, I mean, like, would you not want another guy who's like J.J. Barea? I mean, Barea has been pretty important over the last 10 years, you know? Yep. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, that's. I thought Yogi was going to be that, that heir to the J.J. Yeah. throne, but if it's Brunson, I'm not going to complain about that either. Yeah. yeah. I'm really ready for Yogi to be that new J.J. Barea, but I'm, I'm still sad about that. And he doesn't even play on Sacramento that much. Right. For me watching Carson Edwards and thinking, huh, could he be that guy? He isn't quite play the same, but he's very much has the chucker personality. He's very confident all the time and all this. Um, and then, you know, honestly, just because of, you know, he's a small little guard. He's like barely six, one, maybe six, one. I think he measured the combine, like six foot point seven five in shoes. Yeah. Six even. And that's just not going to run at the starting position. And like maybe because there'll be some more guys to emerge and maybe Carson Edwards, people will worry about how it translates to the NBA or even like, is his upside the right upside? Like, is that the upside you want on an NBA team if he becomes good and becomes like a starter level player? But um, yeah, he'd be really interesting off the bench. But like my thing with Jalen Brunson was like, he's nice, but I, I my, just personal philosophy. I almost never want to draft a backup point guard in the top forty, just because you. It's like they make the less impact generally than like a defensive wing can. Now that's not like saying I'm going to just because they're a defensive wing, I'm going to pick them over the backup point guard. But like, I there's a reason I was a big fan of Gary Clark. I'm not saying I pick him at thirty, but I would definitely like complain. I definitely complained about it after the draft, and then. You could say the same thing about Mitchell Robinson. I like desperately wanted Mitchell Robinson, and he's been kicking everybody's butt in general pretty pretty nicely in, on the Knicks. And I'm in tears thinking how much we could have done with, had we had Mitchell Robinson. You know what? We don't need DeAndre Jordan anymore. Who is Dwight Powell? We can go trade Dwight Powell to the Wizards for Otto Porter. Yeah, you know, you're crossing the line. You're crossing the line. Man. <laughs> I'm joking, okay? But it's fun to dream. Yes, we could tra- we could tra- we could trade Dwight Powell, Dorian Finney Smith, and JJ Barea, and then like the twenty twenty one first for Otto Porter. <laughs> Don't even joke about trading Dorian Finney Smith, okay? <laughs> Otto Porter is that dude for me. He's like my guy. He's like my type of guy. So I'd take him. He's misused in Washington, so I would definitely take him. Yeah, he's like Dorian Finney-Smith upgraded. Yep. So that's just why I would be willing to do it. Obviously, you don't want to trade away Dorian, but it's Otto Porter. Like, so that's just my thoughts on that entire situation. Um, Any other thoughts we have, or you want to go ahead and start closing this off? I think we're in a good spot there. Um, Yeah, I don't have any other top guys I want to talk about. All right. Well, with that, I'm Max Levy. You can find me on Twitter at RangersKing669. 
There is no weirdness behind the history of that name. Um, I have only 185 followers, so if you can please carry me up, so that way we can help promote this podcast even more than we than we already are going to be pushing for like the first however many episodes and trying to get it on as many platforms as possible. Um, updating news in regards to my various sites I work for, the Dallas Prospect is going to be hosting a live remote broadcast of the Mavericks versus Hawks at Mexico Restaurant in Allen, Texas. Uh, on December the 12th, a Wednesday from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. or like 11 p.m. I will be there. Um, Richard may or may not be there. Probably not because he's busy as heck. But if he happens to be there, that would be amazing. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, guys from the Dallas Prospect there. If you want, you can get yourself on the broadcast. We're going to have some deals for food and drink. It's going to be a good time. Um, r- the run... the the guy that runs the Reddit Mavericks account, uh, Ruben Thomas, who finally revealed his name, he will uh, be there as well, most likely, although is unknown as to what time he will arrive. It's going to be a good time, y'all. Um, in addition, uh, my work on Lock Draft is coming soon, but most of that has to do with website problems right now. So it'll be up in the future once we figure out whatever the heck's going on with the website. So, and then for the Dallas prospect in terms of content, I'll have a piece about the guys on the legend, specifically Ray Spalding, Costa Santacunpo, and Daryl crispy, make crispy bacon, Macon buckets, uh, in, uh, the, around the new year and any other guys who I find interesting. I don't know. Maybe Rashad Vaughn will catch my attention. Uh, bids. How, what you got, what you got up to right now? Not much, man. I'm just, just trying to survive day to day with in the in the grind, you know. All right. <laughs> Good luck with your film content on bibscorner.com, as well as your basketball content on bibscorner.com. You can find Mike Bibbins at Bibbs Corner for his website and at mbibs on Twitter as well, both on Twitter. Um, that's about it for you, uh, Richard. You got anything going on? I'm trying to uh, trying to make a goal that I'm going to push out at least two articles a week. Um, by the time this releases, I'll have something up about the Oregon Houston game and just kind of general thoughts about uh, Bull Bull and Oregon. And I went back and watched a couple games today uh, about or with Oregon, uh, including the Syracuse one. So I'm going to post some stuff about that today. Uh, this will be out by the time that the podcast is released. Uh, so you have two, trying to do two posts a, a week, whether it be scouting reports, simple things like uh, what to watch for or something, and previews, post games, something like that. Uh, but yeah, ready for, honestly, ready for the turn of the real turn of the basketball new year when things start to pick up in the NBA. With December is it 15, 14th, whatever, where players can a lot of players can start being traded for that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's big for me. And then obviously. Christmas NBA games are the best things for me. That's what I live for. Uh, <laughs> it's those five back to back to back to back to back games. So I'm I'm excited. Uh, trying to watch more basketball. Uh, saying uh, I don't want to say you know too, something too extreme, but kind of less work, more more play. So yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate this. <laughs> Well, I'll thank you, Richard, because none of this could have been possible without us starting our first dialogue. Thank you and bids for helping us to create our logo. Um, some final uh, things in regards to the functionality of this podcast. Um, Anchor allows us to do voice messages. So if you guys want to like drop off a voice message, we can like include it in our podcast if you wanted to. It would be like having a voicemail inbox all, all the time without even needing a phone number. So you can use the uh, Anchor app or the Anchor website to set that up. I don't know the details about it exactly, but I'm sure Anchor will include a little message for about 15 seconds at the end of this podcast to tell you how, or maybe they won't. You can look it up on the internet. Um, and with that, that is pretty much everything. So we are the third round picks. It's been wonderful talking to y'all, and we'll see y'all hopefully maybe in a week. We're not quite sure how we're going to structure this podcast, but we'd love to hear feedback on how often you'd like to have us uh, come on the internet. So that is all. Have a nice evening. Okay.